From the USA Today Network and YouTube, it's virtually there. Your front row seat to amazing. Every week, we give you three cool VR experiences. One just for the thrill of it, one epic adventure, and one dream destination. Take a breath, take it in, and don't forget to look around. In honor of the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, we go inside the secret weapon that triggered the first shot of the war in the Pacific. December 7th, 1941. This is one of five midget submarines that was used in the battle at Pearl Harbor. A date which will live in infamy. The first shot of World War II was when the USS Ward fired upon one of these midget submarines. The captain of the boat was Ensign Sakamaki and uh, Chief Warrant Officer Inagaki. And this little bitty submarine with no bigger than a six foot width at its biggest point, it'd be very, very claustrophobic. The operating temperature on board was 135 degrees Fahrenheit, so it was basically an underwater sauna the whole time it was underway. This sub uh, ran aground at least twice. Sakamaki and his crew member, Enagaki, jumped out of the sub. His warrant officer drowned immediately upon hitting the surf. He was too weak from over 24 hours in the sauna. Sakamaki was able to get to shore and passed out there on the beach, so he was our first prisoner of war. The aerial assault is what made all the news, but our government didn't know about the midget submarines until this one was captured. Next. Take to the air with Japanese Zeros and a stunning recreation of the aerial assault on Pearl Harbor. The perfect amount of Unreal. The Alcatel Idol 4S with Windows 10. Available at T-Mobile. As soon as they came over the horizon, we knew exactly what was happening right then and there. All hell broke first. We only lasted 13 minutes. Hardly anyone expected that an attack on Pearl Harbor would take place. Didn't even think it was possible. But the Japanese Navy had sailed over 11 days towards Oahu and the Hawaiian Islands. And that morning at 6 a.m., they launched the first of two waves of attacks. When the first airplane broke out of that circle, I said to the kid next to me, we got the best seats for the buzz job today. And as they were watching them down, all of a sudden this rack swung away from the bottom of the airplane. The two bombs. And I recognized her, the first two bombs striking American soil. Then as he banked away, we saw the rising sun on the side of the airplane, and we knew our lives were changed forever from then on. There was a guy praying in the middle of the hallway, and I said, it's too late to pray. I said, we gotta get the hell out of here. The attacks beginning at about 7.47, continuing until about just before eight o'clock when the torpedo planes, dive bombers, horizontal bombers and fighters descended on the Pacific Fleet. In that 15 minutes that had taken place before that, they had wiped out American air power. There was no way to respond. 
ship blew up, there was a fire from the mainmast forward. Everybody forward was practically killed, and men were coming out of the fire and on the deck, and we had to lay them down, and they were hurt. They wanted to jump over the side because they were burning. A lot of confusion, a lot of rumors. It was hard to do things. The main battle force of the Pacific Fleet was in ruin. The second wave had come in at 9 o'clock and sealed the fate of the Pacific Fleet for that moment. The Japanese Navy had achieved one of the greatest victories in their history, and America had accepted one of the greatest defeats in naval history itself. In that one moment, we could have lost that war, but fortunately we didn't. And that's the legacy that we should remind ourselves that this democracy is fragile and we had men and women that stepped up to preserve it for us. And that legacy will never die. Lastly, a moment of tranquility in one of America's greatest national parks, South Dakota's Badlands. our next adventure. Download the USA Today app to catch virtually there every week. You can also subscribe on YouTube. See you next time.